We are very excited to have you all here this evening um, for a little talk about uh, the benefits of art for people with all abilities, but specifically also for people with differing abilities and disabilities. I'm gonna introduce Danielle Garcia. She's museum educator at the Kummer Museum of Art and Gardens. She's been with the Kummer for almost two years now. She's gonna be your moderator this evening and we'll introduce the rest of the panelists for you all today. Thank you, Kim, and welcome everyone. I'm so, so happy that you, you know, wanted to spend your early evening with us. Um, and we're here to celebrate the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I wanted to kind of give um, a formal description of the day. Um, it was started by the United Nations and on their website, it says that the International Day of Disabled Persons was proclaimed in 1992. And it aims to promote the rights and well being of persons with disabilities in all spheres of society and development, and to increase awareness of the situation of persons with disabilities in every aspect of political, social, economic, and cultural life. So there's so much that goes into accessibility, um, worldwide, inter, you know, interdisciplinary um, approaches to providing access to everyone. Um, but today we're really focused on, well, how does art benefit with people um, of all abilities everywhere? So we have a wonderful panel of professionals and program partners um, across the greater Jacksonville area. And today I would like to take a little moment to introduce our panelists. And I will start with Lori Hoppick. She's the supervisor of the arts for Duval County Public Schools. She works to support the visual and performing arts programs throughout this large public school district with a background in visual art, art therapy and art education with special needs populations. Lori is an active proponent of ensuring all students with spec, ooh, all students have access to high quality fine arts education, both in and out of the classroom. So that's really important to us here at the Cover Museum. So she also believes that the expressive qualities inherent in creating are an integral part of every individual's social, emotional, and academic learning experience. So there's so much multidimensionality um, in the work of providing access to people of all abilities. And you know, we'll just learn so much more um, from our panelists. Yeah. So I'll move on and introduce Devin Schiegel. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, very close, Schlegel. It's a Schlegel. one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, she's the co-owner and clinical director at Indigo Art Therapy, where she provides consultation and supervision to other clinicians and continues to provide art therapy services to individuals of all ages. She, after moving from Philadelphia to Jacksonville, she's working with the Cathedral Arts Project as a full-time art therapy fellow. And she designs accessible arts programming for children in ESC classrooms and providing mentoring support to other teaching artists on how to create trauma informed and accessible spaces in their classroom. So that's Devin. And we have another panelist, Libby Heineken. And she holds a PhD in art education and a master's in psychology. And she is the um, co-facilitator of Women of Vision with me at the Kummer Museum. And the Women of Vision program is the 20 years strong program where um, a group of women who are blind and partially sighted meet to talk and create art and you know, ex explore their um, experiences throughout life um, once a month. And more about Libby, she's a, currently an adjunct professor um, teaching college art appreciation courses while editing an anthology of the Women of Vision. So we are working hopefully this year on publishing a Women of Vision book. So we're really excited about that. Um, finally seeing it come to fruition. And last but not least, we have our wonderful Wanda Willis. She's the Director of Community Engagement and Inclusion at the Kummer Museum. And she is a fundraising professional and 
has a demonstrated history of working in community civic program services, education, and nonprofit organizations. So um, that's just a very brief introduction to all of our panelists. So thank you all of you for spending time with us. And um, again, like Ken mentioned, I will be moderating, but would any of the pa panelists like to say anything more, something that I missed that you would like to share with um, the people who are here? Oh, and um, I wanted to give a shout out to the Women of Vision. Um, I don't know if I can see if Sister Elizabeth, the founder of Winter Women of Vision is- Sister Elizabeth just joined us. She's waving right now. Oh, hi, Sister Elizabeth. We're so excited to have you on the yes. call today. Thank you. I'm so glad you got to make it. So she is the founder of Women of Vision. And I know that there's other two women in the program who um, is participating today, Cache and Mary Mamarella. So thank you for joining us. So we have our program participants and I even see Arts for All um, partners. I think I saw Arvid somewhere. So I'm just happy. Thank you guys for spending time with us. All right. So I guess I could kick it off with um, my first question. And since I mentioned Arts for All, the music been the host for the arts we'll festival for many years and is always improving the ways we integrate access into everything we do so what does arts for all mean to you in your work and right underneath you do and feel free this is a casual conversation to anyone in the crowd you can raise your hand and ask a question throughout i'm gonna pick on Devin to start Um, I mean, I think that the concept of arts for all is why so many of us are here on this call today, um, because we inherently understand the healing power of art. Uh, that's, I know, what drew me to art therapy in general is just how um, art making and art appreciation can really be a common ground um, for individuals with uh, differing backgrounds, differing abilities. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like this is, that's such a great way to start off this conversation is just sort of talking about what arts for all means uh, across all of these varying disciplines. Thank you. Yes, that's definitely something that we wanted to you know, continue to explore and improve upon at the Cummer Museum. Um, actually, I will love to um, pick on Wanda Willis to share with us a little bit about our DEAI plan that's in the works, but it's definitely all about access, all about diversity and inclusion. So Wanda. Sure. Well, actually, I was about to press my unmute button to comment on the arts for all. So you got me before I, before I got you, but um, just to really share uh, some of the strategic initiatives at the Cummer Museum. Of course, Arts for All is an opportunity for everyone to be able to enjoy the, the healing benefits of uh, participating in art. Uh, but an overall strategy for us is really to be thoughtful and intentional as we look to just improve uh, what we're doing at the Cummer as it relates to uh, accessibility for all uh, in our plan, really trying to look at every area of the museum and how we can create a inclusive culture uh, really is um, really just the major objective of our DEAI plan, where we are overall looking at every area of the museum uh, as it relates to accessibility. Thank you, Wanda. And actually, there's a smaller museum access team that um, very recently met up to pick up the work that um, our colleagues had been working on back in 2017. Um, we want to make sure that we continue improving on our access programs and our facilities. Um, we're planning on working with an ADA consultant in the future, but there are actionable items that we can tackle. Um, before that happens. So our smaller access team in tandem with our safety committee is working to figure out what those actionable items are. 
um, and just keep the progress going. So uh, let's see, Libby, would you like to share what Arts for All means to you and you know how that relates to your career experiences and maybe your work with Women of Vision? Sure, I mean, there's so many positive things about the, the Kummer Museum with the Women of Vision. And there's so many unique aspects of not only art, um, but there's also the art of writing component that goes with their art making. And one of the things when the program first started is um, another professor of writing, uh, Mary Sue, uh, started working on memories of the, the women of childhood through their lives. And then we started when I, I wrote my dissertation on the women of vision and then we started looking at the component of writing and how that triggers memory because most of our women um, were not congenitally blind. They lost their sight later in life. So this writing component was such a powerful thing to go with the art because it triggered memory um, before the art making part of the program. So it's just been a very special program that I've been involved with for a while. And when you leave that setting, it's, it's, and you watch them, it inspires myself and anyone else that comes in the room always says, oh my goodness, this is such a great program. Um, I know the women sometimes laugh and scoff at their artwork, but it's really amazing. And Sister Elizabeth and I have a running joke because I look at her artwork and I go, oh my goodness, it's beautiful. And she just laughs. Oh, it has to look like a third grader or, or whatever. But they, they really put their thoughts into the art making and um, just to be able to um, work on something in, in the museum setting has been very powerful. I think uh, one of the other little stories, and then I'll stop, is in the beginning when, the, when this first started, the Kummer Museum from the history that I have uh, interviewed people, they didn't know how to work with people with visual impairments. So, you know, at first you think tactile and let's do clay, let's do fiber. And finally, one of the women raised her hand and said, uh, excuse me, when are we going to paint? And they went, okay. So, and then it became, you know, using the string to separate the canvas. And I watched them when we, when we put down you know, the different containers and all right, the square one has the blue that, and I'm thinking in my mind, I've already forgotten what is in which one, but their memory uh, to do that. But I, I truly think getting out and coming to the museum and creating art work has taken most of the women out of isolation and giving them some independence and uh, they have stories written about their artwork. They have some people that have, you know, bought their artwork. And now we're doing the book with all of their poems and stories to pair with that. And it's just been very powerful. Thank you so much, Libby. So since Libby is my co-facilitator of Women in Vision, I have been able to um, spend time with the women. And while Libby leads the writing and memoir sharing portion, I lead the art making portion with them. So we've done painting together. We've done um, collages with tissue paper. We've done clay. Um, this past year, which unfortunately was interrupted um, by COVID, uh, we were working on large shadow box collages, which I think would look gorgeous um, once the 10 or 12 of them are hung up together. Um, but essentially every year the Women of Vision gets to exhibit their artwork that they made for that program year. Um, so if ever you're at the museum and you walk by the Arts Connection, Art Connections area, there's this um, little hallway that kind of leads to one of our studios. Um, and there's there should be a panel that says Women of Vision. And right now we just did an installation kind of exploring a retrospective 
of their artwork of former women and then women who are current participants. And it, you know, it combines their artworks with their poems. And I, I had a I had a funny memory too with Sister Elizabeth. So there was this poem, this acronym BLIND, B-L-I-N-D, and she I like read it out to the group. And then I was like, Sister Elizabeth, like I teared up. And she was like, really? You're a softy. <laughs> so there, there are some tough cookies in, in that crowd. And, you know, it's just, yes, I think, you know, in my position now I'm, I'm, I'm giving y'all my two cents. Um, I, I'm also like the ADA coordinator at the Kummer Museum. So um, I really do lead um, the access programs that we have. So I've worked with the kids at the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. I've worked with kids um, in the Museum Access for Kids program that is funded by the Kennedy Center in um, DC. So I've had experience like adapting to all the different audiences of children and adults um, that I've come in contact with. So I've learned you know, a little bit of sign language. I've learned how to work with um, older women and um, older women who are partially sighted or blind, you know, and it's it's such a rewarding experience to just continue learning, um, you know, just by working one-on-one -on -one with someone. So I also wanted to ask this question to Lori. Um, so Lori, um, in your position as the supervisor of the arts for DCPS, what does Arts for All mean to you in your experience? Um, well, there are a few things that come to mind with it because, um, you know, Arts for All is also the organization at the state level uh, that was VSA Florida. And uh, so I'm on their board, so I do a good bit with them. So that comes up first, but then when we really dive into the idea of Arts for All um, and the Cummer Museum, I kind of had two things that came up for me. The first was when I was in the classroom, uh, specifically working with students with special needs, uh, the idea of Arts for All and the concept around that uh, was kind of the catalyst for my students and the, the ability for uh, my students to be able to have a massive school field trip to come to the Florida or to, um, to the Cummer every year and not only experience what everyone else could experience, maybe even beyond what everyone else could experience at the museum by having those eight different stations where they could make artwork. They were welcome in the space. They um, were greeted and treated like VIP, you know, um, uh, attendees at these events. They were making art um, and they were experiencing it in a way that I could only describe in the classroom. And so it was like everything that I had talked about that they could do through the arts um, came alive at the Comer, and it they saw that I wasn't just giving them lip service. It was, it, this is a real thing. This is how you can experience the arts. So that comes up um, initially and that arts for all through the various programs you mentioned, also the um, outreach piece that when I was in the classroom meant that my students could make art with a museum educator. And then there were two different ways that the comer um, Ex exhibition or um, created an exhibition for our students. And so we had one in that round room and then one, it, our students artwork was the one chosen for like the fronts of the shirts for the VSA festival and things like that. So again, just a huge way to get my students work, which normally is not celebrated outside of the school in a very public realm and in an actual legitimate um, art gallery. And so that was huge. And then now um, in my position, the idea of Arts for All and the way that the Comer facilitates um, professional development and experiences around that mean that my teachers can become more comfortable serving their students of all of varying exceptionalities. And again, the Comer providing that means that I'm not the main person giving them these tools because again, you're gonna get kind of tired of hearing the same person. Um, if the comer is also doing these things, then that's even more of a wealth of information that they can um, use in their toolbox. So kind of a multifaceted <laughs> experience with Arts for All. Thank you so much. Yes, I was totally just nodding my head the whole time because um, I also, thank you for reminding me, there's this 
Um, Museum Access for Kids, that's one of our programs um, in tandem with the Kennedy Center. And this year's installation, um, we explored the art of abstraction. And we have a new installation up by the students at Sandalwood High School. I think we hadn't worked with them in the past, but um, I was working with um, the teacher there and I think I met up to 60 students and um, about 20 of their artworks were chosen to be installed and it, um, those artworks, if you're able to come to the museum, it's right next to the Arts Connections area. Um, and it's all inspired by the Mildred Thompson painting that we have in our permanent collection, uh, Magnetic Fields. We, and we explored the primary colors, complementary colors, and just you know being able to express themselves through tactile art, but also you know really engaging in um, profound discussions in the galleries and gardens when they did come to the museum. And that's a really great thing too, um, to Lori's point about, you know, really just kindling that love and passion of art um, with students and in a new environment. Some of them have never been to a museum before. So I have seen in my experience working one-on-one -on -one, um, with students, let's say students on the autism spectrum, they, I would see them on my school visit and then I would see them two to three more times on field trips to the museum and then we get to make an art project together and then I see them at Arts for All and from when I let's I just remember this one student um, he was so shy at my school visit and I would learn to sign to him and then um, he just was shy and he was you know playing along with the art activity that I have and by the time I saw him at Arts for All, he like totally recognized me. He was like, dang, yeah, like, you know, and it just, it's truly an amazing, amazing experience. Um, we were so saddened um, that we had to cancel it this year. But if you are interested in seeing what the Cumber Museum and our fabulous um, community partners did to um, be able to digitize that experience as best as we could, um, uh, the Virtual Arts for All Festival is on our website for you to explore and check out. Um, so yes, on that warm note, my second question is actually um, kind of teasing more about like your memories with um, your experiences with students or whoever um, you've worked with, um, with varying abilities. So can you describe a memory of an experience you had with someone or somewhere that felt very warm and welcoming and accessible to you. So is there like a standout moment where you were like, this institution is doing it right? Or, you know, you could just share just, you know, great memories of whatever programs you um, have led or been a part of. And I'll, I'll go ahead and start with Devin again. Sure, um, you know, as you were speaking about that immediately, what popped into my head and that's maybe because uh, right before you were speaking about COVID, um, but I feel like there have been so many, um, I mean, the eternal optimist in me is like, there have been so many amazing um, moments in which organizations have been able to pivot um, their accessibility and their programs because of COVID that has, I think, almost opened up and made things even more accessible, especially for individuals with limited mobility or individuals um, on the autism spectrum who have any sort of sensory sensitivity, um, that certain public spaces just are not accessible to them. Um, for example, I, um, as you mentioned, I am an art therapy fellow for a Cathedral Arts Project, and we went fully virtual, which we had not planned on. Um, I started there two weeks before quarantine hit, so it was like, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Um, Wanda, that would be you too. <laughs> yeah, I know I am not the only one in that. I can, I can totally relate to that, Devin. <laughs> yes, um, and, and I think that because of that, I mean, I selfishly miss, you know, working with kids uh, in person and having the ability to offer hand over hand support um, because there really isn't any virtual uh, supplement to hand over hand support. However, there are so many kids that um, I see that are able to join in um, with the accessibility that like Zoom can offer or recorded content. Uh, I was, I was, 
posting weekly like recorded content videos to YouTube for Cathedral Arts Project. Um, and that I felt like made things even more accessible because kids who felt easily overwhelmed could pause things and use their coping skills and take breaks. Um, and come back to it. Um, kids who might overall be overwhelmed by having 20 other students in a classroom can log on and feel like they are making a connection and creating art in a space uh, that is all their own as well. So I think that's definitely, that doesn't directly answer your question, but I feel like it really, it the innovation and the opportunity that uh, this virtual world that we live and, and right now too. I mean, you know, just the, the ability for someone to be able to put on pajamas and then, you know, watch this, <laughs> watch this. It just, it makes things so much more accessible. Thank you so I'll, much. I'll just sort of piggyback on uh, Devin's comment about starting and then we uh, ended up in COVID, which is a very similar situation to when I started at the Comer about eight months ago. And you know, with all of the great excitement for community engagement and all of the great ideas that I was just ready to um, plunge forward to get started and then COVID hit. And so that sort of ended all of that, but just the feeling that the team pulled together at the Comer and really, you know, took a strong pivot to still making things happen and being able to connect with people, with our digital platform, and specifically, I'll just share one really warm story uh, that just occurred a couple of weeks ago with um, a program that we were doing at the Comer with uh, a group of fifth graders. And if you, you look at the kids' faces on the screen and some of them were laying down, some of them looked like they were playing on their phones and literally they were, you know, when you're speaking to someone and, and you look at everyone's face in these squares, and people are looking bored out of their wits. I'm thinking, okay, how's this going to go? And then I'll just give props to Danielle who comes on screen with her dog and pony show, a virtual with three great pieces of art that we have in the comer. And all of a sudden the kids are like sitting up, they're writing in the chat, they're really starting to think. And so that was really just a pivotal moment for me uh, seeing how you can just sort of shift in their thought process. So I think that there are some good things and some bad things about COVID, but it really has really allowed us to, um, you know, the accessibility that many kids who may not have the opportunity to come into the actual museum, now we're able to bring the museum into their homes, whether they're in their pajamas or whatever, but it has allowed us the opportunity to extend our accessibility of beautiful art uh, into kids' homes and their lives. So that was really a pivotal moment for me to share with all of you. Thank you so much, Wanda and Devin. Yes, so just to you know, expound upon that even further, um, bringing the museum and the, you know, the passion and wonderful benefits of the art to people to people um, in the comfort of their own home that it reminds me of um, how the museum, the education team, me and Kim and Dulcie and Carl, we were able to pivot to creating art kits that families could come pick up and we've offered to deliver the art kits so that um, when the virtual program would happen, they would have the kits with them. Um, that's exactly what happened with summer camp. We did a full fledged, um, as full fledged as we could you know, <laughs> um, virtual summer camp. And we, you know, gave the students art kits for the week and then they had all their supplies while they followed along on screen. Um, and then another, you know, virtual program that we did and I see Karen DeMuth, the CEO of um, Connecting Through Music, which is a music therapy program. Um, we collaborated with her and her team at First Coast Music Therapy and we created this really amazing um, extended school year program where the music therapist um, would play her guitar and sing songs. And um, I would jump in and talk about artworks while we're standing in the galleries. So um, we tried it out live um, and through Microsoft Teams. So we had, you know, the paras, the teachers and the students, you know, tuned in live. 
you know, there are moments that worked well, there are moments that we could have improved, but it was a great trial run. Um, we're working on filming, you know, a, another video series with real production equipment. Um, so <laughs> not just an iPad. <laughs> so we're really looking forward to that. Um, but yes, um, I love that you ended up touching on COVID, Devin, because that's another thing too. There are benefits to um, uh, the fact that we did go digital. There are benefits to that, but, you know, so I guess I, I will turn it to Libby. Do you have any like warm experiences you want to share with us or um, any other memories? Yeah, some great memories, so many, but one that came to mind right away was when we had the uh, Augusta Savage exhibition and the women were able to um, go in and actually touch some things and listen to um, a, a lot of the Comer personnel talk about things. And then we have the machine at the Comer that, that raises the paper, the, the heat. The embossing. The yes. And the so they had the harp, um, Augusta Savage's harp there that they could feel. And it was just a moment. And also at that time, I was also um, teaching that to my college students, you know, they, they were talking about Augusta Savage. And I go back to something Wanda said, when she saw people kind of losing interest in the, at the college level, until I mentioned, you know, Augusta Savage and where she was from, where she was born. And they were all like, wait, oh, yes, let me listen to this. <laughs> and then I'm doing the same thing at the Comer and I'm watching the women sit in on a lecture in, um, you know, in the museum and then watching them feel the heart on the paper and talk about Augusta Savage and then the song um, you know, the, the anthem, uh, that was Lift every voice in, in Jacksonville. I'm sorry. I have a really big dog. Danielle didn't read all of my bio. I have an Irish wolfhound and he's very chatty. Um, so anyway, that moment then after one second, no, after we went to the studio, come here, come, come, come. Look, look at the people. There you go. After we went in the studio, then I had a friend of mine that's a harp player come and she played the harp and then they could feel a real harp. And I, it was just a wonderful memory. And then speaking, just touching on the COVID thing, Danielle and the museum sent kits and their shadow boxes to the women and so that they could work on and finish those at home. And some of the women didn't feel comfortable doing that, I don't think, but some of them delighted and finished those. So for the writing portion, I was trying to come up with ideas that would incorporate art or more visual thinking. So one of the, um, the writing prompts was about a fashion show and they created their garment and we talked about if you were an animal what animal would you be and you didn't have to be you know use animal print if you were against that but they came up with visually stimulating stories that you know as a um, sighted person I was like visioning this and one of them was um, a gown that was an octopus and it was so creative and so fun and we, I don't know that we would have done that writing prompt if it wasn't for COVID and if it wasn't you know having to do it and keep in mind when we do the meeting now we just do a conference call because no one needs the the zoom so it is so much fun and we also got to go all summer where the program stops for a couple of months in the summer and starts back up but we decided to go all summer so you have to you know you, you kind of make do with what is going on in the world and they've been um just troopers about it and we've had a lot of fun with that so yeah lots of great memories and lots of uh interesting times and 
really nice yeah. memories. Thank you so much, Libby. Yes, I love the women. They're a hoot. <laughs> so Lori, from your perspective, do you have any um, really warm memories of a place or a person that kind of just, ah, this is so accessible and amazing and wonderful. We got to see it everywhere. Yeah, I, um, I unfortunately don't have a COVID related one because I've spent most of COVID either in hiding because I was pregnant or on maternity leave. <laughs> So I don't have much there, but I do, I mentioned earlier when I was in the classroom, um, specifically at Alden Road, um, I know like from the moment I walked into that school, that was the first time I'd ever been in a place that really every detail had been thought about, about how can we not only be accessible, but help every individual be more independent. And so um, doors that would just open because you moved in front of them and um, and things like that, like every little piece had been thought about. Um, and so that was the first time I had been anywhere that felt like that and, you know, promoted that independence piece. Um, and that was, yeah, it was like a surge of energy, like how can I create this other places? But the second place that I, and probably the only other place I've ever been around um, and had that same feeling was when we brought our students to the Arts for All Festival or the VSA Festival. Um, because again, that was a space that every detail had been thought about, about not only one specific population of student, but every student that's gonna walk through the door, how can we meet their needs, meet, like be able to meet them and then determine what their needs are and then meet those needs. Um, and make them feel welcome all, you know, in a second. And so, um, of course, we took our students there every year, but one year in particular, I had a personal experience as well. So I, um, one of the years I was at Alden Road, I, uh, side note, I used to play adult kickball. And one year I broke my leg playing adult kickball because I was very serious about my adult kickball. I don't play kickball anymore. Um, but I had to work at Alden Road with a broken leg because I came back after surgery and everything. And my principal made me get a wheelchair, which was a whole ordeal. But then every other time I was on crutches. So when we came to the uh, VSA festival that year, I was on crutches with 70 kids and all these parents and teachers helping me. And so um, even again there, I was, I kind of had some limited mobility too. And again, the comer was completely, it was the only other place that was accommodating to my mobility needs because everywhere else had these self-closing doors that would knock me over and then I'd, you know, hurt my leg again. So I don't know, just kind of a, <laughs> an add on to the VSA festival experience we had at the comer. So. Thanks so much, Lori. And I love <laughs> that you mentioned um, Alden Road because honestly, when I joined the museum, I was definitely more so, you know, fresh out of college with an art history degree, right? So um, I, I'm all about diversity and inclusion and access. Um, but, you know, to be quite honest, I was still relatively new to ADA and, and the very specific and logistical things that go into that um, facility wise and mm -hmm. how to operationalize that um, with our educational program. So when I got sent to my first school visit for Museum Access for Kids and it was Alden Road, I walked in and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, everyone just was, it, it felt like everyone was on the same playing field, mm -hmm. leveled playing field where, you know, the students were treated with, uh, treated and spoken to with respect and, you know, and that that's another thing too. They're high school kids, they're high school kids. Mm -hmm you know, with humor and, you know, you can poke fun at them and tease them and they'll tease you right back. You know, they, <laughs> a couple of the kids like flirted with me, you know, and I'm just like, oh, no, no, no. So it's just like, it's the same kind of like environment that you would see in any other high school, you know, and um, except that the classroom that I visited had very specific um, kaleidoscopic tubes with glitter in uh, clear liquid. And that's their calm down tool. So if anyone's having a meltdown, you can hand them this kaleidoscope with glitter. It's kind of like a lava lamp. Um, and they would just slosh it around and stare at it. So little like, um, oh, and I see Devin showed one on the screen. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> so 
those things to just keep them, you know, calm. I mean, fidget spinners do the same thing. There are other types of fidget gadgets um, and sensory objects that I've learned to um, pick up and use in my own art making programs with students. So I don't know, it's, it, it's just a new and amazing experience that I had walked into. So yes. <laughs> and Kim is like, we can all yeah. top down tools. Yes, I wish I had a lava lamp full of glitter. So, all right. Well, I'll take a moment here to see if anyone um, in the audience had any questions to share. We're at 6.42 now, so we'll probably wrap up um, five minutes before seven to you know, say our goodbyes, but did anyone else have a question? Feel free to unmute or um, talk in the chat. I, I'd like to say something. Hi. hi, Karen. Hi, how are you doing? First of all, uh, hi everybody. It's so nice to meet you all. Um, first of all, I am so thrilled to have the collaboration with the comer and what we did with the um, recordings was just beautiful. Um, in addition to being the founder of Connecting Through Music, I have a little boy, Dante, who has Down syndrome and was born without an esophagus. He's 10 years old. So it's really been beautiful to me to see how accommodating and how beautiful our community is for children and parents with special needs. Um, he was in the hospital in Boston for over three years, a year in the ICU. And I'll never forget when we came back to Atlantic Beach and I walked into the classroom at Neptune Beach Elementary School, I almost cried because I, I was like, he, I can do this. This is the right place for him. And I've continued to see that kind of caring and thoughtfulness. Um, I remember the first time I went with him to Arts for All. I did that a couple of times. And he was able to walk around and explore in a way he hasn't. And what it did for me as a mom was it opened my mind to taking him out in the community to other places. Because before that, he had so many medical things. With He had 26 surgeries. Um, he had been on a ventilator for 200 days. So I was almost afraid. But having those experiences gave me the confidence to try other things. Um, and now what I'm seeing with through Connecting Through Music and how we're combining art and diversity with music and we're able to teach the children um, in, at a level that they can understand. It's, it's just beautiful the opportunities that they have and the families have. So I, I wanted to share that perspective. Thank you so much, Karen. And that, that also reminded me of you know, the beauty of collaboration and um, you know, art, how does art benefit people of all abilities? And art is just so general. It can be visual art, it can be music, it can be writing like Libby was talking about. And, you know, we love incorporating all these different mediums and facets of art in our educational programs and all of our, you know, interactions with um, adults, um, older adults and, and children. So thank you for sharing that, Karen. Um, so I guess to you know, wrap up, I have a third question. Um, and this was when I was kind of like, I had recently just got hired and I was like doing my research, right? In um, arts access and where the you know, museum field was at at the time. And the 2017 NAEA conference, the, what is it? National Art Education Association Conference of 2017, their theme was how, you know, educators, and we're all, at least on the panel, educators at heart, um, how, how can we be a lever of change, specifically in the museum field or specifically in the arts um, community? So I was thinking, oh, a lever for change. I think that aligns really nicely with our um, big push with our DEAI plan. So I just wanted to hear from our panelists, you know, what does being a lever of change mean to you in our, you know, Jacksonville community and the roles that you play? I'd like to start with that, um, if you guys don't mind. When I think about change, um, the, the first thing I think about is really finding out what the community's needs are. I think uh, as many organizations, we tend to talk amongst ourselves about what we want to provide for the community, what we think the community needs, but what better way to find out uh, how to cha uh, channel that energy and those thoughts in the strategic planning without knowing exactly what the community wants and what their needs are. So uh, in, in my thought is really 
finding opportunity to have dialogue like we're having right here uh, with various sectors of the community to find out what their needs are so that we as an organization can really take a deep dive into where the need is and how we can fill that need with what we are doing and what our strategic goals are within the organization. Absolutely. And um, it just speaks to, you know, making sure that if we're trying to improve our programs or facilities for a specific group, why don't we have someone from that group or multiple people from that group represented at the table um, to hear from them. So that's so important to us at the museum and um, I'm sure to everyone on the call. So we're just excited. I, I'm excited. The, the Cumber Museum is just in this really great transitional phase of wonderfulness. Um, our current team is amazing. So I'm just excited to see where we where we go. And we're excited to welcome our new director. So um, we're so excited for her. Um, she's coming, I think, in January. So um, yeah, exciting time for us. And we're so excited to finally get back into the groove of things. And you guys will hopefully get to meet her and, and work with her too. Um, we're just itching to connect with you all again. So what about you, Devin? Um, yeah, well, first off, I love that phrase lever for change. I think that's just beautiful, beautiful uh, phrasing. And I, I think that um, I, I love what Wanda said about like, we have our own ideas about what the community needs, but it's important to listen to what the, the community is saying is needed, um, which I think it provides a good uh, sort of selfish on my part pivot to share a uh, uh, kind of news that Indigo Art Therapy has, um, which is that we have just launched a nonprofit uh, for artists with disabilities. Uh, and our hope is to open a safe and accessible studio space. Uh, what we were noticing in our private practice is we would have parents or individuals reach out to us and say, all right, they don't really need like therapy, but they need an opportunity to get vocational training in artwork because they, in art making, because they have a talent, there's just no nowhere for them to go. Um, and so we kept hearing that over and over again. Um, and so we are taking the first few steps. Uh, we just got our 503 uh, status, which is super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're hoping to be able to this uh, to have, you know, once COVID, whenever that is, but we're hoping to create really a safe, accessible, welcoming space um, that isn't that that is, uh, you know, uh, accessible space for individuals of all abilities that provides vocational training, that provides gallery space, that provides representation, all of these things that traditionally the art world doesn't always have at the ready for individuals uh, that are able-bodied. Um, yeah. And Danielle, if I may, I wanted to uh, comment on something Devin said and Wanda about listening to the community because over 20 years ago, a phone call was made to the comer about, um, you know, can, I'd like to do a program. This is Sister Elizabeth who's listening in and one of our members along with Cache and Mary and Sister Elizabeth had called other places and, and talked to other museums and it wasn't possible. But when they, when she called the comer and she described, you know, maybe writing memoirs and working with art and the comer right away said, yes, we can do that. And the funny part of that story is after they said yes, and then later at the end of the conversation, Sister Elizabeth added, oh, one more thing, we're all blind. <laughs> but, um, and this is a very sustainable program that has been at the Cummer Museum because you listen to the community and their needs. So I know they're grateful. I am grateful to be a part of it as well. Thank you so much for sharing that, Libby and Devin. Um, did you want to share anything else, Libby, about being a lover of change? Or is that like your... That was fine. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. I love hearing that story every time I hear it. What about you, Lori? Um, I think I definitely am in complete agreement about not only, you know, thinking about what we think a community needs, but absolutely listening to um, the people in the community about what they need. Um, but 
also being artists, you know, having to think creatively in order to meet those stated needs. Uh, but then also what I found too is um, beyond just talking about what we're gonna do to meet a need, is demonstrating that it's possible uh, because a lot of times there might be some sort of mental block of, I've, we tried that, we're, we can't do it. That doesn't work like that. And so sometimes we, as, those, as, as that lever of change, we've got to show you know that it that it is possible I, I know I ran into that when I was at Alden Road simply because in the what 30 years that they had had a school they had never had an art teacher and so I went in from you know zero to and I and I got a lot of that oh well he he can't do that or he he's going to eat that or he you know and it's well I, I need to see it for myself and then you know just slowly um, breaking down those barriers so that's kind of what I thought about. Of course, and that's kind of what I've been learning too at, um, in my tenure at the museum, being resourceful and adaptive and receptive to feedback, um, and then just learning to adapt um, even on a case-by-case, person-by-person basis. So um, Devin and you, you've, you've been talking about hand over hand. Um, it's really all about, you know, think about you know, ability first, what, you know, you are able and how can you um, encourage that out of the person you're working with and whether you're making art or not, you know. Uh, I hear that all the time from kids that I work with. Oh, I'm not an artist. I can't do that. He can't do this. But really, it's just talking with them and sitting with them and, and really getting to know them and helping them warm up. Um, that's always you know, important to me and how I approach um, my programs too. So yes, um, thank you so much. We have, we're nearing the end of our time. So I just wanted to thank our wonderful panel again. Um, uh, for the people who are listening in, we did record this. So we'll be able to send it out for anyone who um, missed um, this live event. But does anyone want to share um, final remarks? And any, I, I welcome anyone who's just like tuning in too. Danielle, I do want to, I do want to uh, kind of jump off of something you said that I, I feel like I, I say all the, like, as an art therapist, this just, I should get it tattooed on my forehead. Um, but that really the benefit of of art making is about the process and not the product. And that's really where the meat is, um, is, and I, that's sort of been the theme that I have heard um, throughout tonight's discussion is it's not about the finished product. It's about like the self-exploration, the self-confidence, the identity seeking, um, the emotion coping, all of the, the stuff happens in the middle, um, which I think you touched on a little bit, but I think that's really where the change happens as well. Um, Oh, ab absolutely. We definitely during our staff and docent and volunteer trainings at the museum, especially around arts for all time, we definitely um, emphasize process over product. And that does remind me um, recently, I think in the last year, the education team has slowly transitioned from um, a former method of um, giving school tours with our docents and school children to this method called artful thinking. And that definitely to me um, resonates with what you were talking about. You know, it's about the conversation. It's about the exploration and the critical thinking. And it's so adaptive and metamorphic and flexible that, you know, whoever the facilitator is of that tour, you could go down a line of questioning that really pulls on students' memories and experiences. And then that, just naturally creates connections between the student and the art um, versus, you know, just talking and lecturing and, and, and teaching um, just one way, you know, it, we're all about mutual communication and active listening. Um, so I was thrilled that we ended up transitioning to more of this style of tour giving and just programming. So yes, you know, and whatever interpretation or final conclusions that students make with, um, the artworks, that's just, you know, up to them. There, there's something that uh, uh, one of the Museum Access for Kids program participants, Morningstar, which is a private school, um, the teacher there just said, 
you know, after our tours at the museum, all my kids, you know, they just started to light up and, and learn that art and like much of everything in the world is not black and white. There's so many areas of gray in between. And when you can encourage, especially with students who um, are ESC or have, you know, varying abilities, it's so important to just remind them that we're here to celebrate you and what you can do and the ideas and stories that you have. Um, and there's no hard right or wrong. You know, you have your gray area to explore. So thank you. Um, so I think I think that that's a really nice way to wrap up our program tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you once again to Wanda, Lori, Libby, and Devin and our education team and everyone who joined us tonight. Um, I'm just so happy we got to do this. In previous years, we did an in-person studio art project. So this is the first, of course, this, this event exactly is an example of us pivoting and digitizing experiences. So I'm just glad that this inaugural um, virtual talk on International Day of Persons with Disabilities um, was a success. Uh, so thank you so much for making this um, so special.